My name is Jake Harkey. I'm a detective at Boone Police Department. I've been here for about eight years, and then I worked for Concord Police Department a few years before moving up here. Um, thank you guys for having me on here. Um, I'm newer to investigations. I've only been on for about a year, so kind of right when COVID hit is when I moved to investigation. So most of my background was with patrol. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate you being here today. Kat? Hey, everyone. I'm Kat Eller. I'm the community resource officer with the Boone Police Department. Um, prior to that, I worked for about a year with Seth, uh, <laughs> was being a school resource officer, and then Prior to that, I was in investigations for quite a long time and then and also patrol, mostly with the Boone Police Department. Thanks, Kat. Yep. And Seth. Hello, I'm Seth Morrison. I am the lieutenant over the SROs for Watsaga County Sheriff's Office. Um, I'm stationed up here at the high school now as of, um, I guess, about August of this past year. I've been with the sheriff's office for 10 years. I was in investigations before moving to SRO and uh, domestic violence investigations before that. Thanks, Seth. So um, if y'all don't mind, it's, I know we could spend probably a whole week hearing the things that y'all do in a day, but um, if you could take just a couple minutes and sort of summarize for us your um, most common job responsibilities in the role that you have. So Jacob, we'll ask you to go. Yeah, so uh, as a patrol officer with App State, um, in regards to trauma, um, a lot of it's like calls for service. Um, we've had welfare checks, suicidal individuals or suicidal ideations um, stemming from a history of things, not just something right then in the minute, but usually it's a recurring childhood upbringing um, and so, um, but like calls for service, um, kind of one of the weird things about the university is we don't have the high number of like domestic violence. So we don't have like that side of things per se. We, I've been there for five years and I think I've gone to two um, on campus. So um, I'll let Boone and, and the Watauga County Sheriff's Department touch more on that as far as the trauma aspect of that. Um, but for me in the day-to-day -day things, um, you know, we, we just see students uh, having issues, stress-related, school-related, relationship-related, um, or things that have come from home, you know, from past traumas um, growing up, um, especially in the LGBT community. Um, and being in the South, I'm originally from California, so like being in the Bible Belt area and kind of that religious aspect of their family members shunning them because of their um, them coming out. Um, some of the things like the university is really nice because it has pretty much everything built in to accommodate students. It has a counseling center. It has like the infirmary. Um, and so all of our officers um, go through a, a crisis intervention team training um, to be aware of people in crisis um, and better able to interact and deal with them and get them the help that they need. Um, but it is kind of the nice thing about the university having those things built in. They have like the Dean of Students Office will assist students. Um, you know, there's a care team at the university that identifies students who are going through some sort of an issue um, and they will make contact with that student and for their entire time at App State will follow them to make sure that they succeed. Um, as far as um, Things that I guess I do, or uh, I don't know, Denise, stop me if I'm going too far ahead or taking too much time, but like- um, That's good. If you want to stop there and let yeah. everybody else answer, that'd be perfect. I, I like your point that there's some really concrete support systems that are not already only built in, but really close by. And so as we go on, we may get into more of how system supports either helps y'all or hinders you in what you're trying to do. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jake. So um, as a detective, like I said, most of my background was in patrol. Um, as a detective, where we see a lot of trauma and just my general calls, um, we do have a good many assaults, uh, whether that be, you know, just a bar fight to sexual assault in nature. Um, it also involves a lot of kids. We work closely with the CAC um, and DSS um, as detectives here. So primarily, I would say that's the most we see in investigations. Um, on patrol, you, you see it everywhere. I mean, it's, it's from 
a domestic assault to it's to the wreck where, you know, the kids thrown around and it's just a traumatic experience. It doesn't have to, you know, before this group, honestly, I'll be the first one to say, I did not think of trauma as, you know, I'm a swap medic for, I thought of like <laughs> penetrating trauma, like, you know, you, you, I didn't think about it in that way. And so it's been really good to kind of see this side of the group um, looking at ACEs and stuff like that uh, has really helped me. But as far as from a detective standpoint, I would say the big ones uh, would be the um, the violent assaults and then the sexual assaults in nature that we deal with. Property crimes as well, felony property crimes, pretty much every single uh, felony property crime. I feel like I arrest uh, when you talk the last one I arrested on Friday, his childhood was there's nowhere to really describe it when I think about my childhood. It was just a rough childhood, um, which I think that leads to a lot of our property crime, our assaults. It, it just seems like it's a never ending cycle. Jake, I appreciate you bringing ACEs into the conversation. Most of us who have, are on this call have been hearing more about ACEs and childhood trauma. One thing we've been talking more about is even beyond those original 10 on the ACEs list are all the other things that are traumatic for children, like accidents or injuries or um, long-term medical um, illnesses, either the parent or the child. So that was actually um, some new information for me as well, that we've really expanded the list beyond that original 10. And a lot of those things y'all see more of um, than some of the others. So thanks for that. Kat. Hello everyone. Um, again, my role right now is a brand new role that the Boone Police Department started back in August. Uh, and the role is community resource officer. And it's a, a big umbrella of things, but the, the big biggest part is just I'm a liaison to the community. That, that sums up a lot of what I do. Uh, my, the bullet points on my job description, I think grew from 10 to like 50 in like two weeks. So <laughs> it was kind of crazy trying to keep up with everything. Um, I'm kind of in the backdrop of, of really what patrol and investigations are, are doing now. I was, I, I was with investigations for over seven years. So in that time, I can say um, I, I saw an extensive amount of various traumas. Um, a lot of what Jake was talking about. Um, one side that I did want to want to bring up is a lot of times when we're, we're dealing with uh, a violent crime, especially, or uh, a suicide or, um, uh, well, anything violent, really. The, the part that people don't think about with us as, as cops is that we have families that we have to sit with um, that have been through extremely traumatic experiences, uh, whether it be they just lost a child to suicide, um, an overdose, um, or accident, uh, you know, it could be a number of things. And to me, that was, and I'll just share this experience, just said to me, that was probably the hardest part in law enforcement is having to give a notification to a family or just sit with them in that grief when there's nothing you can do. And so, um, so as, as officers, we're not just the ones that go out and arrest and, um, you know, write tickets and, and investigate crimes and all that, we, we also get called into situations where it's just heart-wrenching. So um, that, uh, so as the community person, I, I'm just involved in with a, with a lot of different groups. Um, I've been with WCCI since really the beginning. <laughs> so I'm um, very aware of ACEs and everything. And I, I love what, the, what this group has done. Um, it's been pretty awesome. And, and just to see um, how, you know, even Jake getting to know and Jacob and, and Seth on here, just knowing that these guys are very much well informed and on trauma and how to, um, to navigate through things like that with people. So um, I could talk a lot about it, but let's, let's move on to Seth. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. I appreciate it. Sure. Seth. So <clears throat> my roles here at the high school are numerous. Um, not only here, but overseeing the other SROs in the county that Watauga has in, in helping assist them in what they need. Um, as far as what I deal with here is pretty much everything everybody's already mentioned and then some. Um, kind of like ASU, though, we've got a lot of great 
school counselors and school social workers that we get to work with that are here to uh, take on that that role of helping children who have dealt with trauma. Um, I try to assist them as much as I can. As far as trauma we deal with, I see everything from children in domestic violence homes, um, children with suicidal ideations, um, children who have gone through sexual assault and abuse. Um, it's, it's a lot and it's a lot to deal with. And, and a lot of the trauma these kids are dealing with at this age is um, it affected them greatly mentally um, and, and getting them to some resources that can help them, giving them somebody to talk to uh, that they can help try to work through those things is my main goal. My goal as a resource officer is not um, laying the law down on children. I look at my role as being exactly that a resource to the school and to parents and to the children in this county to help them as much as I can in any way that I can, whether it's being someone they can talk to or reach out to or buy them lunch, whatever, whatever I can do to help out is what I try to do. I'm glad you brought that up, Seth, because when you first came in SRO, I was in a presentation that you did where I think our traditional view of the SRO has been like a cop on campus, like you said, laying down the law. And I feel like the focus has been moving towards, and you spoke about this that day of being a support, being another positive, consistent, caring adult. Um, sometimes building a relationship with kids where all they've seen is officers coming into their house in the middle of the night and taking a parent away. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Another thing occurred to me when you were talking, to put it in context, what we hear about statistics of trauma is at least 60% of us have had one traumatic experience and something like 10 or 15% of us had had four or more. And so if you have a building with 1,500 kids in it, if you start doing the math about how many, you know, for every four kids you walk past, you've got one person with at least one traumatic event. And so that's quite a few kids walking around in the con same contained space that are having issues that y'all are having to deal with. So thanks for that. Absolutely. Um, Jacob, so let's talk a few minutes about, um, you mentioned some of the, one of the benefits of being at Appalachian is that there's resources close by that have already been identified as resources for you, but what are some of the things that you might um, do? And Kat had a good point in that. Um, you can sometimes be sitting with somebody having an enormous crisis at the time and, and not really feel like you're doing much, but just being present, which is important. But what are some of the things that you try to do for people who are in trauma or crisis? Uh, so for me, um... I have a degree in sociology, um, and so kind of being aware of some of the issues society goes through anyways, like I just try to be a human being, right? Treat them with respect, treat them as a fellow human being. Um, and so some of the things I've also done is I've gone through the Appalachian ally training that the university has for the LGBT community. Um, I recently went through the immigrant ally training that they just created um, this past year. Um, and try to gain better insight um, and understanding to be able to better effectively communicate with people. Um, and, and a lot of it to me is just showing humanity towards someone in crisis. It's not about, you know, I might be there for a specific thing that might be this really horrible incident that happened to them, but I'm not there necessarily to punish the victim, which unfortunately oftentimes does happen they get re-victimized and and have to you know when you're getting information from them they're reliving that experience and so just trying to be mindful of that while i'm interacting with them and not re-victimize them um you know and, and kind of being aware of my role as an officer to make sure that they get the resources or, or are aware of the resources available to them um, you know, there, there's the Dean of Students Office, um, the care team, like I've already mentioned, the counseling center, um, you know, and we also utilize like Daymark and, and Oasis and, and being aware of all the resources that the community has, not just App State, but Watauga County as a whole, um, you know, and, and making sure that they understand 
these resources are available to them and, and even helping them sometimes get in contact with those resources. And I've seen you at the, there's a sexual assault response team, domestic assault response team. I've seen you at those meetings and I'm sure all of y'all belong to some community collaborative where you're learning more about the resources and network and so I'm sure that goes on as well. Thanks, Jacob. Um, Jake? Yes. So um, J Jacob kind of said it the best you can, um, just be human. Um, try to treat people with humanity, respect, uh, empathy. As cops, you know, you get into the job and it, don't get me wrong, like especially your first year, you know, it's exciting, you know, it's fun and everything. But you do, you do kind of get worn down um, just with seeing so much trauma and kind of sad stuff. You also have some of the happiest things you'll ever see. Um, that experience has helped me um, over the past 10 years at least kind of see people or see through their eyes as best I can. I'm not going to see when I've done the ACE test and stuff. I don't score that high. Um, I was very, very fortunate. Um, so it's been really helpful for me to kind of try to take a step back. A lot of times, even victims, honestly, they'll like attack you when you get there to a scene of something that's really serious, but it's not that they're, they're mad at you. They just, it's emotional. They don't know how to react in the circum. Uh, in that situation. So just trying to take a step back and try to see it through their eyes is the best as possible. Um, it's really hard at times because you don't know that situation when you get there on scene. You don't even know who the victim is a lot of times when you get there. A lot of times it's just chaos. Uh, so the best thing we do is try to slow things down, uh, try to take break everything down to make it, you know, a slower pace so you can actually take your time and figure out what's going on in that situation to resolve it as best as possible. Um, Jacob and Denise just brought it up as well, using our resources. So as officers, uh, a lot of times we don't have the resource. I mean, I will go to calls with the kid and I'll try to play with them and hang out with them as best I can until another, you know, call or a situation comes out that I don't have the luxury to stay and help that kid. So a lot of times we end up having to depend on, you know, um, DSS and the CAC and Oasis and Daymark. And those have been invaluable resources for us as officers to try to figure out, and, you know, if they're younger, Seth, somebody like that in high school to try to get them involved in some type of program. So we try to do the best with, you know, uh, yeah. the situation. It's just not always, doesn't always turn out the best, but we try. Well, what I like about what y'all both said so far is when we think of resources or interventions, we're thinking of programs and buildings and people, you know, staff. And y'all have both mentioned that one of the most important things is the perspective that you bring when you walk into a situation, which I think is a really crucial point, not just in law enforcement, but in interacting with human beings. So thanks for mentioning mm -hmm. that. Cats. Gosh, I don't even know what else I could add to what they've said. Um, the, you know, one thing Jacob said is, as well as Jake, is just that there's so many resources in Watauga County. Um, so what I try to do is when I'm encountering someone is just already be thinking like, who do I know that could help this person? Um, especially in the Hispanic community, I have Yolanda, I can just pick up and call. And most of the time she knows who it is. And so... And then um, whether there's already a resource of, um, that they've been in touch with or you know, she will know exactly where to send them to. Um, definitely if, they're, if it's a juvenile, uh, school resource officers and school counselors, or school social workers are my go-to people because um, you know, they'll know the situation a whole lot more than, than I will. Um, and so, you know, when the officers themselves, and this is something I'll address, is that when the officers actually go to a lot of these traumatic events, um, what I try to do is just check up on them. Um, like, hey, are you doing okay? You all right? You know, even like a couple weeks after that, you doing okay? You know, if you need to talk, that's good. If, if not, it's okay. But just trying to be aware of how it's affected the officers as well. Um, um, as they've gone to these these different calls. And so that's really it. I mean, as far as um, we have, so like, again, we have so many resources. Um, I think that she is actually working from home. Um, so she's not physically in the office, but I can see if she can give you a call back. 
Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Takes me a second to get to the mute button. Uh, oh no, it's okay. But um, but yeah, that's really all I have to say. A lot of things have already been said. Thanks, Kat. Um, there's sure. been a question in the chat we're going to come back to about resources for officers. But Sam, okay. I'm going to um, ask you to um, talk to us a little bit about how you support people in trauma. So um, obviously, like everyone said before, the the resources that are out there for for people to work with you know dealing with kids there's some other ones the we'll talk youth network and in different uh programs they've got set up that that are great for kids the one thing that uh that jake said that i like to touch on is you know he talked about being with someone during a traumatic event or after it happened and and, and making a connection but then having to do do his job and do something else I have the luxury and one of the joys of my job is that I get to spend more time with these kids that have been through traumatic situations and take extra time to reach out to them. And some, it may take, you know, months of just kind of chipping away and, and trying to make a connection and staying on it and staying with them. So I really enjoy that part of my job because that is something that, uh, that's hard to deal with and you don't always have the time to go back and check on people. And, um, and I, I appreciate cat checking on the officers because doing, doing this job sometimes can be tough. I know when I was in domestic violence and investigations, you know, dealing with some horrible situations and, uh, infant deaths and things like that is, uh, it wears on you as a person. Um, and, you know, a lot of people look at us and see a uniform and a badge and authority, but we're all just people and we're just trying to make it the best we can as everybody else. So that's a really good segue, Seth, into um, what resources are available for officers. I hear y'all saying y'all try to check on each other. Are there other more formal things or how do y'all process your, the secondary trauma that y'all experience from dealing with such intense events? Um, was that for everyone or back to Seth? Um, we can start back at the top, Jacob. So you go ahead. Um, I know for me, um, like my new year's resolution this year was to do more yoga. So like exercise, yoga, um, I play soccer. Um, I try to do things outside of law enforcement related. Um, and it helps, um, but also just, uh, I know Kat touched on it, like being there for other officers, right? Being that source for venting and frustration to let them get it off their chest. Um, and, and I think a lot of times we see in law enforcement and, and just my experience in the military as well, where you kind of call someone weak for expressing feelings and we have to change that mindset to actually um, allow people to express their feelings openly and yes this does affect everyone differently some people can handle it and others it really really traumatizes especially any officer will tell you anything involving a small child usually is like the worst thing that they can imagine dealing with um and so like just being that source uh, you know where they can honestly express themselves and their feelings to you and, and not like talk down to them or, or, you know, call them weak for having said feelings and, you know, and this whole macho bravado, you got to be strong and, and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, me personally, it's like outside resources, sports activities, working out um, <laughs> and whatnot. Thanks, Jacob. Jake? So um, I would say kind of a different level. So I have like what I do personally, but then there is also a professional, you know, in the actual law enforcement side. So Kat said, you know, check on your officers. That is, I would say that's been the most helpful for me. And I think for other officers, I would say that's the most helpful um, besides maybe some personal stuff, but hands down uh, when you're in these really bad situations, typically the, as an officer, the only person you feel like can understand that situation is typically another officer because um, they were there. They saw the same things. That's not the case. Like I, there's other people you could talk to, but typically, you know, they're your close friends, they're your teammates, they're, you know, those are your buddies. So those are the people you talk to first. 
um, in really bad scenarios. So when we have, you know, like uh, when we had a shooting in Ash County with our SWAT team or, you know, the double homicide, when there's really, really bad situations, uh, we do have briefings. Um, so there are law enforcement briefings that were held with um, smarter people than myself um, to try to help us and work through those situations to, to make sure everybody's okay. And it, and Jacob said, it, it kind of depends on the person too. Um, you know, what you've seen, how you handle stuff, uh, and those situations, those have been great for me, um, in personal life. And I think every WCCI meeting I've ever been to people mention outdoors exercise. I'm the exact same as everybody else. I love outdoors. I backpack and ski and, uh, just about anything outdoors that I can. Uh, that's what I'd rather be doing than sitting in this panel of office right now. Um, but no, so that's hands down outdoors. And then also volunteering, hanging out with friends, just general life. Uh, enjoy your life outside of this job because you have to. Connections and relationships. Uh, thanks, Jake. Kat? Sorry, I didn't know if you were going to unmute me or not. <laughs> so, oh, no, I didn't know okay. I was supposed to. I would have been happy to. Oh, it's okay. I was like, oh, I better find the button. Um, really, I, I think, uh, you know, they touched on it. There are um, employment, um, I forgot what it's called, Jake. It's like M EOP, EA? EPA. EPA. <laughs> EPA. And it's basically um, our counseling services are always available to us through our employment. Um, if should we need to go and you know, have, make a visit or schedule a visit. Um, there's also, when there is a, a huge event, Jake touched on this too, there are the briefings. It's called like basically peer support where the last one I went to a couple of um, uh, trained people in the peer support group who are uh, former or current law enforcement that have been through major situations and have had training in debriefing will come to our area and whoever wants to go to this. Some agencies require their officers to attend these debriefings. Others leave it as an optional thing. Um, and so we'll go to these big debriefings and then the people have been trained in peer support will actually um, basically facilitate discussions. And it's basically a, a time where we can, we go around the circle, introduce ourselves, And then next time you go around the circle, you say what your role was. And the next time you go around the circle, it's like, okay, uh, how do you tell us, tell us how you feel about what happened or, you know, and I saw the last one I went to, I just saw a lot of, a lot of healing in that um, with officers talking to one and, you know, basically sharing the experience and, with others who, um, with the group, and then next thing you know, you've got two or three others who are like, yeah, I feel the same way, where otherwise they wouldn't just call each other up and say, oh my gosh, I was so tore up about this. Can we talk about it? <laughs> so it, it really, um, those are really, really good things. And again, those happen with big, um, uh, mostly major events like shootings or murders or um, anything like that. Uh, as far as, um, me personally, um, I mean, I, I, I mean, who's not going to say outdoors? I mean, I, I love getting outside. Um, I hate being cooped up. That's why I do love my new role because I'm not behind the computer all day. I'm out in the community, and um, and so, and also just just my faith in in Christ. Like I am, I love I love my church body, and I, I love the support that I get there. Um, that's huge for me, um, and just family. You know, my family, they are extremely supportive, especially my husband, because um, our schedules can get a little wonky, um, you know, with uh, sometimes like if you're on a shift, you work days for a couple of weeks and you work nights for a couple of weeks. And then next thing you know, you got a whole shift that's out because they had a COVID exposure and you're like, hey, and they're like, hey, can you work a six to six the next four days? And so you're kind of all over the place. So having that, that support at home um is is pretty huge oh and dogs I gotta say dogs don't forget the dogs don't don't forget the dogs all right Kat thank you Seth do you have anything to add to that um not professionally they've hit on about everything that you could hit on they've done a wonderful job I can only speak to 
what I do personally to try to um, make the job better. Um, when I was in investigations, it was a, a completely different role than what I do now. So um, separating work from home was a big thing and just being able to shut off when I left, you know, obviously, except when you're on call and you have to do. Um, but now the role that I have now is, is great. I regular schedule and I'm big into family time. So anything I can do with my family, uh, I really enjoy spending time with my son. And, and now I don't have to separate the job as much. I can actually enjoy my time off and still be somewhat in the SRO role, helping out with sports and um, different youth events and, and things like that. So it's it's been a welcome change. And I didn't tell y'all we were going to talk about this, but it just occurred to me um, as we've been talking in the Wednesday conversations about how people stay well. Um, we've talked a lot about boundaries and not taking on too much and how to take care of ourselves so we can keep taking care of other people. So Seth, I'll, you haven't got to go first yet. So I'm going to ask you to answer this, but is do you, are there any tricks that you have or ways you visualize that separation? What y'all do is really intense. So how practical ideas about how people who do intense work can kind of separate and, and do good boundaries? Well, it's, it's tough. You can never completely shut it off because doing what we do, um, you know, people are going to look to us. If something happens, whether we're in uniform or not, People are going to look to us for answers or to, to do something. So you've kind of always got that uh, in the back of your mind and, and ready to go whenever something happens. Um, but just trying to focus on what I'm doing, say I'm, I'm hanging out with my family, we're doing something. We like to travel and, and go uh, camping. We have a, a motor home that we travel in. We do these long road trips. Um, but when I'm spending time with them, I try to be there with them and not thinking about other things that I have to do or other things that I've had to deal with. Um, sometimes it's hard, but, you know, most of those things are, are always going to be there or will be there when you return to them. So just being able to separate the job from everyday life, because being a cop, it can easily become your everyday life, the job. And, and that's one thing that I think burns a lot of people out is, is not being able to get that separation from, okay, here's what I do while I'm at work. You know, a lot of people, that's all that they do. They, they do the same thing when they're at work or when they're at home. That's, that's what they're always thinking about. So I, I just try to separate that in my own mind and, and uh, you know, turn off the cell phone and enjoy who's in front of me and have real conversations and, We've been talking more and more in, in the Wednesday conversations about how wellness is not necessarily a practice or activity, but more like a mindset, what you choose to think about, what you choose to focus on and your perception. So um, what you're saying is kind of in line with what we've been talking about lately, but thanks for that. Jacob, any um, tips for people on how to do boundaries and separation and leave work at work? Uh, well, for me, I'd probably say that I'm different than most people because I have plenty of officers tell me that I'm crazy, but when I'm off duty, I don't carry a gun. Um, and so for me, it was something that I kind of picked up in the Marine Corps when I came home from Iraq carrying a rifle for seven straight months and then no longer having that rifle, kind of having this anxiety of like, oh my God, where's my rifle? Um, and so for me, like, when I'm off duty, it's not caring at all. And I am a human being and reminding that aspect that I'm a member of this community. Um, and so I'm a part of this community. And, and so like that balance is really important to me. Um, and so like, I know people say I'm crazy and, and whatnot, but I also, you know, I'm not Boone PD or the Sheriff's Department where they have their regular people that they deal with every day. So it is slightly different and I do acknowledge that. Um, and, and so, but for me, it's, it's kind of finding that balance of like, okay, I have to remind myself that yes, I'm a cop, but I'm also me. I'm also Jacob and I'm a member of this community as well. So that's just what something I've done. So 
but I know every cop I've talked to is like, you're crazy. Creating separation and whether it's not carrying a gun or something else, it's a routine that you have of stepping from one role to another role. So, um, and that works for you. Um, Jake, any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, and I, 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 I don't think Jacob's crazy at all. I think there's probably more, there's more cops that think like that. It's just not the cop mentality. Um, it, it's like you're supposed to carry a gun and you're supposed to go like, and I mean, I grew up around guns. I grew up with family that hunts and stuff, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to always carry a gun. So I, th I think I'll go ahead and say that me, Kat, Seth, and Jacob are probably a little bit more unique from law enforcement. Just when I think about the four of us, like as far as personality wise and everything, um, there are differences. The same with any career, there's always going to be different personalities. Um, possibly the reason the four of us are on this call, like this group specifically, is because we have those types of uh, traits about us. Um, but for me, as far as separating, uh, like they said, they, they hit the nail on the head. It, it's just getting away from work. You try to separate. Uh, I've listened to, you know, uh, every call, like last week, uh, Jordan mentioned something, you know, talking about how, you know, she would call law enforcement for a client. And it was like, she felt weird doing that. Um, but in y'all's role, when I hear you speak, I feel like it'd be even harder to separate because, you know, you're working with these same clients week after week. Um, for us, I feel like a lot of times we do step, get to step away because we might go to a call and then we're off to the next call. And then um, we do have our regulars in Boone. Um, I'll be honest, I avoid Boone. Uh, and that's, I love Boone, but I just, I don't shop here because I don't, I don't want to run into things that I live in Banner Elk. So I stay in Banner Elk. So that way I don't have to deal with the issues that occur when I'm in Boone. I, I couldn't go to Walmart like in uniform, out of uniform and not know 20 or 30 people, uh, good and bad. Like, you know, they may hate me or they may love me, but I, I'd rather just stay in Banner Elk and that's like a happy place for me. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, Seth, I think you touched on some of this, talking about focusing on your family. Anything else that you want to add before we move on to the next thing? Not really. That's just, that's my happy place. But like Jake said, it's, it's, um, he hit on a big thing in, in being able to separate and that's avoiding certain areas and, and places because you know, you're going to run into, uh, a lot of times people who don't like you um, and, and know you from the job. And, and that's kind of tough. That's, I think that's why my family would like to travel so much. Cause when we travel, we, we go places and we don't know anybody. And, you know, when you're, when you're like that, you can, you can focus on yourself a lot easier than you can when you've got somebody giving you the evil eye because you had to deal with their dad or deal with them two days before. Yeah, that makes sense. I was just checking the chat. So um, one of the things I wanted to cover was how we stay well, but I think we pretty much covered that in that last question or two. So um, anything that I haven't thought to ask you that you'd like to share? Um, Kat, when I, Kat and I were talking about this conversation that was gonna happen a few weeks ago and she brought up, you know, it's not just about the trauma that we step into, it's also about um, how it's traumatic for us. And it's, you know, it's especially there's been a lot of times of unrest and challenge in these past few months. So um, just wanted to reinforce that I hear you saying that, Kat, and that's something I want us all to be more aware of is not just the traumatic events that are happening outside of you, but also the toll that it takes on you as well. Um, what else would you like us to know about what you do or how, so thinking about community and thinking about trauma, um, how we can be more supportive or, or just anything that we haven't talked about yet. Um, Jake, I'm going to let you start this time. We'll share the love. Um, yeah. oh, um, well, I mean, for me, it, it's kind of thinking deeper about it too because yes we deal with trauma or people going through trauma but as we've seen recently law enforcement can also create trauma on people um, and so it's it's not 
just about you know how we deal with it and how we interact with it but you know in a blink of an eye we have the ability to be judge jury and executioner um and sometimes it's justifiable sometimes it's not and so like we have to be aware of the fact that we also can create trauma in the community um and you know i was reading a new york times article about the bronx district attorney office that's uh, exonerating a person after 30 years of being in crime for a, a murder he didn't commit because of faulty police work um mm -hmm. and you know the it was a 16 year old kid who came home and found his mother dead and they charged him with it and so you know and that's 30 years of potential trauma to that person and his family because of our bad police. And now granted, this was what, 1989 that this happened. So, I mean, things have changed a lot, but it's also being aware of the fact that we have a role as well in all of this and, and not just helping people through it, but we can also kind of check ourselves to make sure that we don't further exasperate the problem and, and create trauma on people as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, what, one thing that I'm reminded of, and when we train in schools, somewhere there's a video that we show in schools because whether it's officers or law enforcement or teachers or doctors or whoever, there's this concept that trauma, changing your perspective about trauma might not work in whatever field I'm in, whoever we're talking to. But there was a video one time in something that we showed at school of an officer. This was from Washington State who, um, said when they first started talking to me about this trauma stuff, I thought, yeah, that's fine. We'll just give them run of the streets and just let them do what they want because, you know, that's what this is. And he said, you know, after I've had training, I realized the consequence is still the same. Like they're likely still going to jail for a jailable offense. But the difference is how I approach them, how I talk to them, what the conversation is like when we're putting handcuffs on, what we talk about on the way to the jail. So while the outcome may be same, the same, the perceptions and the treatment and the conversation are different. And that really struck me. And I've used it a lot with teachers and other people because that's not just a law enforcement thing. I think one of the things with trauma is that people think somehow we're lowering accountability or something like that. So I appreciate that perspective that um, it's sometimes what we bring as humans to the, to the experience, our own trauma, our own personal beliefs or biases um, about what our role is and what we're bringing to the situation. But, so thanks for that. Um, Jake, do you have anything to add about um, just in general, something you think we should know? No, I'm terrible at just general questions. You're supposed to ask specific things that I can like, try to answer. Um, uh, no, I, I think, uh, from what Jacob said, yeah, we we can definitely cause trauma, and we have. Uh, cops have screwed up. I've screwed up in what I've said, the tone I've said something in so many times, not even realizing that the way I said something, you know, has come across to someone completely different. Um, and kind of when what you said is, I don't know how many times I've arrested someone, and we're at my, I arrested someone on Friday, and he said we're best friends at the end of it. Uh, we listened to music together while I waited on the magistrate and just kind of hung out. It really does depend on how you treat people. Um, I don't know how many times, you know, you you have a really bad situation and yeah, you have to handle it with accountability, arresting them or, you know, some type of repercussion for their action. Um, but you can still be super, you know, friendly with them. You can be pleasant. You can... Uh, you know, try to be the best person you can to them, even in that bad situation. Um, and I think Jacob said it, we aren't looking just to arrest everybody. Uh, I hope that's not the theory. I, I know it does seem to come across that way sometimes for sure, um, just because that's what's kind of seen. But we also, you know, for every interaction that I, or every arrest I have, there are dozens and dozens of interactions with the public um, where it's just kind of, you know, either a pleasant interaction about nothing law enforcement at all, um, just general conversation to, you know, there might have actually been a criminal transaction or a criminal incident, but, you know, we handle it a different way. So, but no, nothing general, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good, Jake. Thanks. 
Kat, what would you like to add? Um, one of the things that you asked is what I would like for everyone to know uh, that's on this call. And um, we get a lot, which has been great. Boone, Watauga County, awesome community. Uh, we get a lot of, hey, thank you for your service or you know, someone's paid for our meal, um, whether through the drive through or at a restaurant or coffee shop, you know, we, we get a lot of that, which is fantastic. And we love that. It always makes us feel good. Um, so what I would encourage everyone is if you see one of us out there in uniform, um, please don't be afraid to just come up and say hello and introduce yourself and just get to know us and get to know all the officers, or as many officers as you can out there. Because you never know that one day you're, you're going to be in that fender bender and you're going to be scared and or something's going to happen that that officer, or one of the officers that you just met may just show up at your door or be there to help you out. And you already have that relationship established. So don't be afraid to approach us. I know in the past, you know, maybe it's been like, oh, I want to go up in front of a cop, you know, or go talk to a cop. They might think I'm going to try to get their gun or something like that. It's not like that. Most of the time, if you see us sitting there talking, we're not talking about cop stuff. We're talking about the game last night or something stupid or an adventure that we're getting ready to go on. So donuts. Uh, huh? Just to talk about donuts. All yeah. the time. Yeah. Please bring us more donuts. We don't get enough donuts. I'm joking. I'm, I'm totally joking. Just don't bring us any more donuts. I love you guys. But um, anyway. <laughs> Um, but overall, I think, uh, like I said, this community is great. Um, and uh, just try do, and as far as social, ma'am, I want to address this real quick is um, with social media and different things that you see out there and different people that vent or express their opinion on something that happened on Wataga Democrat or anything. Just please be mindful that, you know, we have families um, and there's a lot of stuff that happens that we can't share with the public because it jeopardizes cases. So I, I do want to put that out there. So thanks. Thanks, Kat. Sure. Seth, any thoughts you have on something we haven't covered or something they've said? Um, I'd just like to touch on a few things. Um, like Kat said, the community we live in is great. Um, the the love that's that I see every day just from people that I interact with is amazing. I just ask that everybody remember that we our people as well. A lot of people like to to look at law enforcement as uh, as we should be infallible, and we're not. We're we're human, and we make mistakes. And um, I've always been a firm believer that you know it, it's okay to make mistakes. It's what you do after the mistake that makes the difference. Do you correct the mistake? Do you own the mistake? And I, I've always tried to do that. But um, you know, remember we're 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 community members too. We're not, we're just like everybody else. We, we have lives and we have families and, um, you know, we do the same things that everybody else does. Um, we're not here to throw people in jail. I've, I've not met a cop in my career that enjoys throwing people in jail. The times that we have to deal with people in situations like that are because of something that they have done not because of something we have done and we do our job to try to help the community and make it a safer place not only for our families but for everybody else's as well and a lot of young people that i deal with now have an attitude toward law enforcement like we are just trying to cause people problems and and uh make their day a bad day and that's not it at all I, I know people have bad days. People make bad decisions. I've made a ton of them. Uh, it's the, the lessons we learn from those decisions. I guess it all starts when you're young. The, the thing that I hate the most is when I'm out in public and I see uh, a mother and a child and the mother looks at the child and says, see him over there? If you don't behave, he'll throw you in jail. And that's where it starts. And I look at the little kids when, I, when their mothers say that and I say, I don't throw children in jail. I'm here to help you. I'm here if you need something. And, and it's kind of that stigma we've got to overcome um, that's causing a lot of issues for us. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so we've got a few more minutes if anybody wants to um, put something in the chat. There's been a lot of 
positive comments about thank you for what you do. And I'll copy all those and send them to all four of y'all so y'all can um, see some of the things that were said. But um, I'm gonna stop for just a minute or two and see if anybody has a question that we haven't covered that you would like to ask one or all of our people. So I'll give you a second. Um, when you were saying, Kat, to come over and say hello, I was thinking, and bring your children, you know, when you're talking, mm -hmm. Seth's talking about setting a different precedent, um, and you see sometimes my daughter will come and show me videos on her phone of children walking up to officers and restaurants and offering to, you know, say a prayer for them or something like that, mm -hmm. so obviously we model for our children, um, you know, what healthy relationships are. And that's part of what we talk about in WCCI is being a relationship coach. So um, not just going over to say hello, but taking your children over as well. And there was a mm -hmm. question, um, Seth, about the DARE program in schools and whether or not we still do those. Can you answer that? Yes, we do still do the DARE program. Um, I'm DARE certified. Paul Scott is DARE certified. Kat's DARE certified. She taught last year at Parkway in Green Valley. Um, this year has been we haven't been able to do the program because of COVID and no in-person learning. So when the students are here, they need to be spending, you know, hundred percent of the time on, on academic stuff. Um, so we haven't been able to implement the program this year. We'll probably try to catch up next year and do most schools. We do the DARE program in fifth grade, um, some in sixth grade. So next year I'd say we're going to try to double up and do fifth and sixth and get the, the classes this year that we missed in. But yes, we do. Um, we have plans for, we have one empty SRO position and I have uh, two other officers that are not there certified yet, but they will be this summer as long as the classes proceed as, as planned. Um, one thing I wanted to mention came from something one of y'all said when you're talking about support and that is I'm sure like a principal or your supervisor or any supervisor the amount of support and the culture of your organization depends a lot on who your leader is mm -hmm. and so you can have um, somebody who's understanding and understands about the need for support and um, trauma-informed practices or those kinds of things all the way to somebody whose expectation is you don't show emotion and you handle things and go on about your business. And so just like the impacts of trauma depend on our own history and our background and all of those things, it also probably the amount of support that you feel I'm imagining depends on who your leader is and, and what type of leader that they are. I'm just reading a couple more chats to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, seeking mental health, so here's a question, seeking mental health support still has a lot of stigma is, do you think that that attitude is improving at all within law enforcement, that it's okay to seek help when you're struggling or having, um, mental wellness challenges? I'll address that. I actually, I, I think it is changing, um, just because of all the stuff that we have been through in the last few years together as departments, um, that people realize that you know, it's okay. Um, and a lot of times when we go and get help or seek EAP or anything like that, it's not something that is um, known. It's kind of secret. So I think more and more officers are becoming more self-aware. Um, and also with the, the this up and coming generation, it's, they're a little bit more, they're different, um, a little bit more, I don't know, what's the word, Jake, I'm looking for? I want to say touchy feely, but you know, just more emotional. No, it's just a different, yeah. Just different. I don't know touchy feely, but yeah, it is. It is. I different. mean, I we just see it in our training. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, so even if for new officers coming on, there's a very different um, mm -hmm. kind of generation. And I, I mean, I'm 32, but there's a very different generation from the new people I'm training coming into our department. Um, someone just put emotional intelligence, and yeah, I mean, we do. Yeah. So since 2014 was kind of the first I kind of saw it where it was more implicit bias training, more emotional, you know, intelligence training. Uh, there was a lot more kind of the EAP stuff coming out right around that time. It does seem like there's a shift in it. Um, 
I, I honestly, I don't know why that kind of started occurring unless it was just smarter people being like, Hey, this is stupid the way we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Let's go this way. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's a good thing. I, I, I don't think anyone, you know, there's resistance. Don't get me wrong. There's always going to be resistance to people trying to help you. Um, even for cops that do that all the time, but, uh, we, uh, you know, I think it is getting better and it might be the generational thing. One of the questions in the chat that you've kind of answered is self-care taught in law enforcement. You kind of touched on that a little bit. Maybe there used to be the stereotype of, you know, tough it out on your own. We're moving now more towards it's okay to be impacted by the things that you see and get help for those things. Do they, do they do any kind of regular training about wellness practices or um, taking better care of yourself? Or is that something that y'all kind of figure out on your own, you think? Well, we do have something like that comes up in in-service every year about that. It's a, I don't know if it's a mandated in-service or if it's a chief choice um, type of in-service training, but that's addressed. And also all of our new officers that come into the police department they're given a book. Um, I think it's called Emotional Survival. Is that the book? Mm-hmm. Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. Yeah. And that's an excellent book to have them read. And I should reread it. So that's awesome. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. So we got it's two minutes till. Um, I'm going to let y'all go. There's one more question. Do you notice a decrease in criminal activities when officers patrol neighborhoods to let their know to let people know that they're in a supportive way? Any thoughts about that real quick before we jump off of here? So less criminal activity in areas where y'all are out there regularly and not just for calls. Um, okay, I'll go let you guys. Yeah. Well, so being at a university, I know that the cadet program is actually getting a lot of critique because now they're seeing a bunch of college aged people who are sworn law enforcement officers. Act. So like, I, I would imagine it depends on the community, but I know the university is kind of like, uh, we don't want this. Um, and so I, I guess it would depend on maybe the area. Um, but I do know that there is pushback because of now you're seeing a bunch of sworn officers, whether they're part-time college aged cadets or police officers or the full-time officers where they're actively patrolling and visible. Um, is it deterring? No, not really. Cause they're still finding stuff and people are still going out to the trails to smoke weed and whatnot. But, um, but I, I know that there has been some pushback, especially at the uh, um, faculty Senate level um, as far as um, against the idea of college aged people are basically enforcing laws on their peers. So I, I would say it depends on the community. And if you have to go, I know it's, we're at one o'clock, so jump off if you need to. But I know like with the sheriff's department, y'all have identified areas of um, like higher concentration of crime and either assigns people specifically to those areas or put officers out there on a more regular basis. And the, the thing that I heard Seth was that did seem to help that crime rates in those areas. Am I... Am I remembering that right? You think? Yes, absolutely. We have a we have a um, a crew of three officers that that work on just that. They they go out in problem areas where uh, citizens call in and say, you know, we've got people that are that speed up and down this road all the time. We have children playing out here, or you know, if we have areas that have had some breaking and enterings or breaking into vehicles. And they will go and that will be their their job for a week or two is they'll saturate that area and just be seen and talk to people. And it helps tremendously. It helps cut down on, you know, whatever the issue is, the speeding or the breaking, breaking and enterings and, and things like that. But, um, yeah, it, it works out in the county. I can imagine it's a problem on ASU. I wondered about that myself when they created the cadet program and have peers policing peers it's uh, i'm sure college age kids um don't take it too seriously when their roommate is trying to law lay the law down on them for something they're doing it works out in the community yeah it seems to work uh i, don't, I mean i don't know any stats as far as reducing crime but in our you know our higher crime areas even in the town of Boone, even though we're overall a safe community we do have higher crime areas um those areas when we do 
kind of not so much target enforcement, but when we actually do spend more time in those areas, actually just kind of like what the, I believe the question was of just kind of community relations, community relations and, you know, the, the community uh, oriented police officer. I think it does help, but I don't know any stats. I would say one of the things it helps is not so much just reducing crime, but it builds rapport enough to where when there is something bad happening, people will call us instead of just like pretending I don't want or not pretending, but they don't want to call the police because either a, a law enforcement interaction or when they were a kid, a cop took away their mom and dad. Um, whether it was a justified act or not, they might not want to call law enforcement. Um, so I think even if we don't reduce crime, say specifically like B and E's, at least people will call us to report and say, hey, Jimmy down the road, he committed this crime. And that that's helped out a lot, I know, building those contacts and those relationships um, through not enforcement, but actually just kind of what Kat does, those community um, relations is huge, I think, in my opinion. All right, thanks, y'all. I'm gonna let you go. We usually don't run over, but we're all fascinated and appreciate you spending time with us and had so many questions. So um, everybody that's listening, these people are going to do a presentation for us at the conference, similar to this, but I'm sure it'll be different as well. So you can catch some more of them if you want to hear more. Thank you all so much for being with us today. I'll send you comments of the chat. We appreciate you making time for us, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>